Hey, Feminist Frequency Radio listeners. <laughs> this is your girl, Ebony Astor, and what you are about to hear is our very first live show. Unfortunately, neither Carol nor I is in it, but Anita is, and you're going to love it. It was recorded on February 21st while Anita was on the Joko Cruise. If you haven't heard of the Joko Cruise, it's an annual event full of music, comedy, and general nerdery coasting along the Mexican Riviera. So in this episode, Captain Anita and uh, game industry vet Felix Kramer got to sit down for an in-depth interview with uh, writer and actor Will Wheaton, who basically opened the floodgates on a whole host of topics. Before we set sail in this week's episode, though, I want to remind you that everything Feminist Frequency does, including this very podcast, is listener, reader, and fan-supported. Thank you for helping us stay on the air and on the web. And if you want access to special perks and exclusive backer rewards, join our podcast community at d.rip slash femfreak. Drip members can also have access to a bonus episode every week. So, you know, get on that. All right. Now it's time for Feminist Frequency Radio Live. <laughs> Anchors away. Oh, yes. We are doing our very first live show, and we are in front of live people who are so extraordinarily wonderful. Yes! We're actually on the Joko cruise sailing across the Mexican Riviera. This cruise is filled with music and comedy and authors and podcasts, and I guess I fit some of those categories, so I'm here too. I am joined by some very special guests. Feminist Frequencies board member and indie games producer, Felix Kramer. (laughs) Yeah. Take it. Yeah. I'll take it. Yeah, I'll take it. None of you know who I am, but that's totally okay. (laughs) They will soon enough. And also, the indescribable and multi-talented Will Wheaton. Hi. (laughs) Thanks, everybody. This is the show that asks you to be critical of the media you love, or alternatively, we are the feminist killjoys coming for your media, depending on your perspective. On today's episode, we're going to be a little loosey-goosey, because this is Joko style, and we're just going to chat about some of our pop culture influences and, you know, talk to each other about the things that we like and don't like. We're going to finish the show by each sharing a little something in What's Your Freak Out? Now, let's start the actual show. Hello, guests. Hello. Hello. How's the cruise going? I have been on eight Joko cruises, including this one. Wow. Is that all of them? That's all of them, yeah. My favorite one will always be the very first one because nobody really knew what was going on, uh, particularly (laughs) the non-Joko passengers that were on that cruise. Um, (laughs) And it was really fun. There was a sense of discovery and excitement uh, that that happened that that year. And I I feel like those of us that have been here since then, there's a a special bond that exists for that. Um, That will always be my favorite one. But this is the cruise that I've had the very best time on. Nice. Um, it, I have been I have been super relaxed, and I have like for the, and 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 I think that's me. Like I feel comfortable in my own skin for maybe the first time in my life. Yeah. And and it's, thanks, thank you. And uh, and I've I've been able to kind of get out of my own way and have fun. So I've really been enjoying it. It's that's been really awesome. nice. Yeah. And Felix, this is your second time. Yeah, it's my second cruise, and uh, I don't know anything about the time before, and that referring to the time when you all shared the ship with non-JOCO members, uh, which sounds hilarious. <laughs> it just uh, sounds like a comedy. It does. It sounds happen. absolutely hilarious, and I'm kind of sad I wasn't there, but I do. Uh, I, I was here last year, and I think this year um, definitely was the fr- I mean, it's my first year as a performer. I was here as, uh, as uh, an attendee last year, and it was amazing um but you know i resonate what will said resonates with me insofar as like it takes me until about day three to really relax on any vacation you know like um day one i spend the entire time waking up in a cold sweat thinking i've me- missed a meeting uh day, uh, day two, like i'm definitely late for exams in university or something uh and then day two i kind of like force myself to just lie there because i'm seasick which helps a lot 
And then day three, I get over the seasickness, and suddenly re- my body goes, wait, you don't have to go to meetings? And I say, no. And it goes, and you don't have internet? And I'm like, well, I won't tell you. I paid 100 bucks for a little bit of internet. But we're just not gonna- <laughs> I gotta say, day, not we're having just gonna internet. pretend as though that didn't it's happen. It's spectacular. Not, yeah, and not, it's great. Not, not jamming my face into the dumpster fire that is America every day has been yeah. really great. Yeah. I, yeah. I think, and for, forgive me if, if this is, if this, it's silly to say this, but for your listeners who don't know what the Joko Cruise is um, and, and don't know what we're talking about when we're saying there's us and then there's like the, the snorks um, who are like the muggles of the cruise, um, Jonathan Colton, super popular, well known, amazing uh, internet entertainer and musician, uh, started doing this little cruise charter to get nerds together to talk about nerd stuff, and it was kind of like a fun, like, like floating convention. It was like, if anybody's ever heard of uh, the show Wootstock that I did with Paul and Storm, it's kind of like, it's like that, but on, a, but on a ship for a week, right? The first few years, we shared the ship with normal people, so there were like muggles on the ship, and, and they would be like, hey, you're one of those nerds. And I would be like, I sure am, you fucking snork. Um, and starting with last year, we chartered the entire ship. And it's incredible. Every person you see may not love the same thing you do, but you can be guaranteed of running into people who love things the same way you do. Yeah. And it's just this wonderful, positive, inclusive, uh, uh, forward-thinking, uh, uh, inspiring group of people, and it is my, it's one of my favorite weeks out of every year. Yeah, well, that's so lovely. Yeah. I, uh... And I'm not saying that to, I, I appreciate your applause, I'm not saying that to pander to the audience, I'm saying that to your listeners yeah. who may not be familiar oh, with what sure. we do, to understand the environment in which this, this podcast is being created. Totally, it's, and it is, it is hard to describe the feeling, like, when I got invited to be on the cruise, I was like, <laughs> yeah. you want me to be a performer? I don't, do I perform, what, would you like me to lecture everybody about video games? <laughs> <laughs> uh, apparently so. Um... But I was like, and a cruise, and a cruise has never sounded appealing to me. I've never, like, been like, oh, I should go on a cruise. Um, so the combination of that and, like, being stuck on a boat, that may be questionable. Sure. You know, like, I'm like, fans can be great, but I have a history of potential, like, hostility that could happen. So I was, like, really iffy getting here. It's within moments, I was like, oh, this is the best. Like, like these, imagine like, this group of people are so wonderful and respectful and kind and caring and like the performers are all wonderful and it's just I it's hard to describe it's like it is summer camp right it's it's being yeah. able to hang out with the best people playing video, uh, board games all night long it's your favorite convention that you've ever been to but there's no dicks yeah. anywhere yeah that's yeah. What I was say. yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I, 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 every year we're like, come on, there's going to be some dicks. And it never happens. Yeah. And it's like this self-selecting group of people who are just like, you know, I'm not going to tell people I know who are dicks about this. <laughs> yes. <laughs> no dicks and allowed. Gonna, and we're going to protect and, we, and you're going to, you know, like we're going to protect it. Like nobody wants to be the person who brought the dick on the <laughs> <laughs> exactly. All right, let's talk about some pop culture. That's kind of what this is about, right? All right. Uh, which is also related to the cruise in so many ways. Um, but, okay, we're, you know, there's lots of different ways that we can go about this. I think it might be interesting to... I thought it would be interesting to hear about how, like, pop culture has influenced our lives and our careers and our choices and just, like, what it means to us. So why don't we start with, like, what is the last thing that you watched, read, played that had a really big impact on you? I mean, Black Panther came out right before the cruise. It sure fucking did! (laughs) The night before we got on the boat, I was trying to organize a group of people to go watch it again because I couldn't quite contain not seeing it again for a week. Like, it was just so And someone did do that, but before we got to the... Hotel. So yes, I didn't, yeah. I didn't. I didn't yeah. make that cool group of people. Yeah, we didn't. Yeah. <laughs> what? Oh, no, no, we won't. No, no, no. So this is, we feminist frequency has already spoiled the shit out of that movie. So that's up for all the people who have internet in the world. Um, yeah, what about you? So I, I, I'm in a second Black Panther, um, and, and and I would love to tell you about an interesting experience I had um, uh, being like so. Uh, uh, I am. Let me see if I can do this right. Um, I am. I'm a. I'm a cis straight white dude, 
Um, uh, you sure are. Yeah, I super am, right? I'm like, uh, I, I'm the problem. <laughs> I am, uh, my demographic is what's wrong with everything in America right now. And I was watching. I would have to and, agree with yeah, that. Yeah, well, totally. Yeah, yeah absolutely. We are the worst. I'm 100% <laughs> on board with that. Yeah, absolutely. Here's this thing. Here's this thing in, in, in Black Panther that I, that I love. I'm watching Black Panther and I'm like, I want to be like Wakanda forever. Not for me. I don't get to have that. And that's totally fine. Because you know what it is for me? Literally every fucking thing else in the world. Like, it's totally fine. It's totally fine. And that was, that was an amazing feeling for me. Because I thought what it must be like to be a young black kid who is just like, oh my God, all the heroes. Like, all the people who look like me and none of them, like, none of them are like the cartoon bad guy. Um, I, and I, I, I loved it. Um, uh, and I'm really glad Rothfuss it arranged a big screening and, oh, and, nice. and dragged a bunch of us out to see it. And I was so glad because I, if I waited, I probably wouldn't have seen it because I'm just lazy about that stuff. Sure, but sure. I want to tell you a thing that I, that I, that I liked um, doing be, like long before, before that happened. Um, I played whatever the most recent Castle Wolfenstein game is. Okay. Wolfenstein. And, yeah. and this Castle, is, and Castle Wolfenstein, Wolfenstein is very cute, though. Yeah. Okay. So, so, so this yeah, is a, this yeah. is a thing that I loved about it. Um, I'm real, real, real not okay with how there are fucking Nazis in America who are like, I'm a Nazi. That's great. I'm super not okay with that. I'm like, I'm really, it really fucking bothers me. And um, I loved just. Beating them to death with pipes. <laughs> in a video game. Oh! I I loved. I know. I know it is, and I'm gonna own it. I'm gonna. I, I will 100% own like that. That kind of aggression is maybe not the healthiest thing in the world. And um, but I'm an adult, and I know the difference between fantasy and reality. And the fantasy that I experienced of walking into a alternate timeline, Roswell, New Mexico, where there are. KKK collaborators walking around the streets, like doing the bidding of the Nazis, um, and I could walk up behind them and uh, hit them with a thing, and then keep hitting them after they fell down, and their bodies never degraded, and I could just beat on them as much as I wanted to. It was a tremendously satisfying feeling, and that is that is and and, 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 and that's a, I know, I know. I know. I, 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 I absolutely know. No, I know. And one of the no, reasons I want to... I appreciate it, but there's just so many things that I'm like, okay, it, but when do I interject about the feminist, feminist frequency stuff about media mattering? Yeah. I, 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 you're 100% right. You're, you, you are 100% right, and I know that. And it's why I wanted yeah. to mention this thing yeah. that, that really mattered to me instead of another thing, because I yeah. get that it's complicated, and I get that, that, that yeah. there's... That it, like, that my absolute love of murdering the fuck out of Nazis is a little problematic yeah. uh, or a lot. Did you play Wolfenstein? I haven't played it. I'm not, I'm not done it yet, but yeah. I have. Yeah. So I, we, I experienced the catharsis. Yeah. yeah. We, so we played, we, we talked about it on the podcast uh, before other episodes of the like nine episodes we've ever, oh, 15. And this was yeah. episode, this is episode 15. Anyways, um, <laughs> uh, I, what I think, so whatever, I don't need to go into what I think about the, the movie, but the game, but um, th- what I found fascinating was how, like, the, har- like the, the harassers, the white supremacists got super riled up about the fact that it, there was a game about killing Nazis. Yeah, being anti-Nazi and, is a controversial position in the it, games industry. <laughs> What? Right, but you're, you're like, literally how many games exist where you kill Nazis? It's like, you either kill Nazis or zombies or, or aliens. aliens. That's it. That is why first-person shooters exist. Yeah. And so, like, the fact... So, it was really funny to watch their marketing team just lean in hard. I thought it was great. I thought I, I really did. As much as I do not like that game, um, I really appreciated that they were like... Yeah. And it shouldn't... The stupid thing is that it shouldn't be like, oh, good for them for like leaning into anti-Nazi stuff. Like, no, was, no yeah. you did. That's the right thing to you do. You don't get cookies. Like, you, you don't. You don't get credit for not kicking a cat. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, yeah. like that's like you, totally. yeah, you did the right thing. Well, okay. So speaking of Nazis. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of the doom of the world, uh, I'm interested in like science fiction right now. And you know, you were on a panel earlier about modes of storytelling. Yes. And I and um, it was a really great panel. Yeah. And one of the things that came up on it was that 
uh, where the future of science fiction is because there's so yeah. much dystopian sci-fi right now yeah. and it feels like it was planned for our current time but it wasn't right right it's one of the things I said on that panel was you know I think the question was like with things that are there there are uh, she she asked about the new Blade Runner movie um, and and one other one other thing and I can't remember what it is um, that was sort of like you know, it, it, that was objectifying to women and was was dystopian and and was like like why is that getting made now at a moment where like we live in that? And <laughs> what I said was the development cycles on on movies and things are years long, and all of that stuff started like like the development cycle for Blade Runner started like before. Trump was fucking a porn star while his wife was pregnant. I mean, that was like a very long time ago. Um, uh, a yeah. really good timeline analogy, yeah, yeah. though. It's very um, specific. It's just uh, so vivid. <laughs> I could have made a. I could make a pun instead. You could just, no, please, please. No. Are you sure? Trump naked oh, or pun? I'm going to take Trump naked. Thank yes. you. Yes. <laughs> But I, but I did, yes. but I did say. Which is the most horrifying decision to have to make. I, you know it? what? When presented with, yeah, no win. I, 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 I did say on that panel that one of the things that, like, I hate a lot of things about the Trump administration and 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 all of his Vichy collaborators in Congress. But the thing that I hate the most is that they took my dystopian fiction away from me. I love dystopian fiction. It, right. That has been my thing for forever. I have loved it, and I can't watch it. I, sh- I have a hard time. I loved the first season of The Man in the High Castle, and I started watching the second season, Where and I was are. like, I can't watch this. I can't do it, and it's not because it's not well made. It's not because it's not a good show. It's because I want escapism from what is terrible in the world, and, and that is not, I'm not getting it. Yeah, well, and a lot of uh, creative, um, like, science fiction writers are talking about how, like, the the reality of the world right now is so bizarre that you couldn't make it up. And yeah. so they're actually having a hard time with, like, believability in their narratives because if you wrote this shit, people would be like, oh, God, it's so ham-fisted. Yeah, and yeah, like, John yeah, Rogers right? says that on Twitter all the yeah, time. Yeah, like, reality every time is poorly some, written. Yeah. Yep, every yeah. time some new thing is revealed, like... Where, where it's just like, are you kidding me? If I tried to write this arch comic book villain, if I wrote Paul Manafort as a character, that would not get out of the first draft. I would be on this podcast being like, oh, God, it's so heavy-handed. Why can't they be more subtle about it? Yeah, like, it's unbelievable. <laughs> it is unbelievable. And, and so what I, what I hope, what I hope will come out now, and we'll start to see this in the next six to probably 18 months, is we will see more aspirational, positive fiction and Amy Berg made this point because women are 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 speaking up and being heard right i mean i think women my experience as a dude has been that i've heard women speak up forever but i have never experienced women being heard the way women are being heard now and this is like generations overdue right yeah amy berg said there are showrunners who are unemployable now because their their history of of abuse and misogyny finally caught up with them. Yeah. And I I think that you know I I struggle with this because I want to separate the art from the artist. But there are times where what who the artist is mm. it infects the art. I mean that's one of the things about being an artist, right? It's like this is my interpretation of a thing or or yeah. whatever. And and uh, I think we'll start to see. A cultural shift in our entertainment, and 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 we will see things where, yeah, you idiots, the Nazis are the bad guys. <laughs> um, Felix, yeah. question for you. Me. So that's a nice segue into. I can't do transitions if anyone actually listens to the podcast. I have. You were to, doing a great I to, one. I, was, I know that was a really good transition. You know, it was yourself. so good, and then I always ruin it. <laughs> like this is the thing. It just okay. without fail. So here we are. Um, I, well, one of the things. So. Have there so with all of the um, you know talk about me too and and creators and art and what does it mean and the, 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 the yeah uh, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, Felix and I have a special language that, that you can now be in on um, is there have you have you changed the way that you engage with media have you stopped 
watching or playing I mean, it's things hard that you not didn't... to yeah it's right it's what? hard it's hard not to right you you load up a show and a thing that I, I, I really struggle with with film I'm not in film or movies I'm in video games and I struggle with this in video games too where um, autorism takes over and one person gets credit for an entire project that a thousand people worked on yeah. and it's really tough though when you turn on TV and you're like oh I'm gonna watch this new show that I you know and and an abuser's name just pop, like in big bold letters pops on the screen right it's like Produced, not even produced by, just like they don't even say that anymore. They just put the name up, and that's happened to me a lot recently. Where like I have to think twice now, right? Do I? And I often don't make it all the way through. So I'll start watching. I'll be like, okay, okay, okay. But this person, can I name names? Yes, of course. Like, so yes. the thing that happened to me most recently was it, I tried to watch Dirk Gently, which is a great show, and it's filmed in Vancouver. I'm from Vancouver. Filmed in Vancouver. Uh, so I get to like I love stuff that's filmed in Vancouver because I get to call it out as not really being fucking L.A. or, yeah. or Cairo or wherever the hell they think. <laughs> like, where like that's not uh, that is yeah it's two minutes from my house or the flat. I love CW shows for that too, where you're like, oh yeah, you're super science building and it's our stadium or yeah. like. Uh, <clears throat> so I love shows filmed in Vancouver. I love all the, pretty much every actor in that show. Um, and and the first name that pops up on the screen is Max Landis, and I'm like, ah, oh, I'm exhausted. I'm so tired, and I don't want to do this. And yeah, you know, somewhere in there, what happens is if any if the show makes a misstep or or does something that would normally I would give it like give it leeway for, I tend to just say, no, I'm going to turn it off because now I'm seeing, oh, that's probably a reflection of someone who's actually kind of shitty, yeah. right? No longer do I see like, oh, well, I guess someone made a bad joke on the writing team. Now I'm like, no, I attribute it directly to this human yeah. who, and whether that's right or wrong, I think, you know, at the end of the day, I'm becoming more conscious of the stuff I'm, I'm, I'm A, becoming like um, more conscious of, you know, uh, credit and where it's due so yes I do look up who else worked on the project if it's a project I like and I go look, seek out things that not shit bags are making right yeah. I, don't, I don't just say what else has Max Landis made I kind of go and look um, but also it, it means that like my conscience is, is loud is louder than it used to be and I think that's a good thing overall I think yes like I could say oh it's ruining media for me but you know the whole point of feminist frequency is be critical of the things you love and that I'm able to do that now with more call-outs and more uh, just generally better culture around. I don't know if it's actually better. I can't, say it's, I can't say overall if it's better, but I know that my circles have become, the conversation is way more open now, and I can say, oh, yeah, but that was made by a shitbag. And my friends are at least saying, oh, really? Tell me more, rather than, oh, but I heard that wasn't true. Right, right. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, as someone in and around Hollywood regularly, have, has, do you feel it? Do you see it? What's your relationship to media like now? I am not as connected to Hollywood, capital H Hollywood, as a lot of my coworkers are. Yeah. Um, I'm far more an independent uh, author and internet personality yeah. than I am an actor, uh, and in spite of my best efforts. And um, um, I, I have always done my best to sort of like keep my head down and, and stay out of the way. And, I, and I've never, to the best of my knowledge, I've never been in a position where that has enabled some terrible person to continue being terrible. Um, for a long time, I wouldn't talk about how terrible Rick Berman was to me when I worked on Star Trek because I didn't want to burn any bridges. Mm -hmm. But the reality is he's a horrible human being and he sabotaged my career um, because he could. And, uh, and I started talking about that a few years ago and it feels good to be able to, to talk about yeah, those things and, sure. and have those conversations. Um, I am very f grateful that the people I have chosen to have in my life um, have to like kind of be vetted, you know, like um, I will not be friends with someone because it is convenient or it may advance my career because uh, it's probably not going to advance my career mm. and then I'm just going to feel like a shitty person because I was, you know, close to a shitty person. Um, so as these things have happened, the people who I am close to and the people who I consider to be my friends are not being named because they're not garbage humans. Yeah. And I feel really, really good about that. And, yeah. and, and, it, and it makes me feel like my instincts are right. And that choice to live, I think, in ethically uh, has paid off because I'm not running into that. What I am running into is like 
I, tr- I, I checked out of Woody Allen movies 15 years ago. I mean, like, yeah. Like, I mean, I was just like, yeah, that guy's a fucking child molester. Fuck him. Like, I don't want to see anything he has to do, and fuck you for working with him, because everybody knows. Totally and, agree. And, like, Woody I'm Allen super was... in on that. <laughs> where it is... Where it is really... Ch- and that was, you know, easy, because I don't like his movies I was anyway, just going to say, Woody Allen right? was the easiest thing for Here me is to where it's because I hated his movies to begin with. Where it's real hard is Tarantino. Yeah. yeah. It's real hard for me because I, I love his scripts. And, and I do know, Felix, you were talking about lots of people working on things. Mm-hmm. He's legendary and mm-hmm. infamous for doing tiny bits of work on a script and taking 100% of the credit for it and pushing people out. Who That's horrifying to me. And in, and in movies, especially movies that already exist, thousands of people were involved in that. And because a person like Tarantino turns out to be awful, like it's hard for me to watch Kill Bill now as much as I love it. It's hard for me to watch it knowing what Uma Thurman went through. It, that's hard to watch. It's like, oh, now I am participating in someone's abuse. Like, I never saw French Connection, uh, not French Connection, uh, the Brando one, uh, uh, where uh, Last Tango in Paris. I never, I've never seen Last Tango in Paris, and now I never will. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, 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 no, I never, I know, yeah, I never, I, ne- I never will. But part of me feels like, shit, man, like, that was, a, that was like, that, as a, as a piece of art, that was a really important film that a lot of people really talked about, and, 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 and it is studied and, and all that, but if I watch it, I'm participating in the past in someone's abuse, and I cannot do that. I cannot be okay with that. I really, really struggle because I like Inglorious Bastards a lot. My hatred of Nazis is not a secret. <laughs> like, I... I learned a lot about <laughs> filmmaking and pacing and storytelling and editing from Pulp Fiction, and I yeah. still really enjoy it. So mm. I have a friend who his rule is if I loved something before I found out that the people involved it were, it were shitty, I can watch the old thing, but I can't watch new things from that person from like the, the point in which I learned that thing. So here's my pushback on that. Which I know, I I know, I know a person... You? Used, to, used to know a person. Sorry. I pushed this person out of my life the instant I found out about this, who was an abuser. The instant I found out, the next thing I did, I hung up the phone and I was like, fuck you, you're out of my life forever. And, and that was the end of it. And that, and that was that. I cannot go back and look at things that had happened before then because then I feel like, oh my God, I was, I was fooled like everybody else was. I was close to an abuser and I didn't know. Yeah. What could I have done better you know, what, what are things that I could have looked for? Maybe there wasn't anything at all. But uh, it does not retroactively make me feel like... It makes me feel like I, I should have known, I wish I had known, I wish I had had more insight into that. Instead yeah. of, I'm going to let myself off the hook and give myself a mulligan for that. Like, I don't... I completely reject that idea. And I think that... And I hope that going forward from this... From, from like, starting months ago, that especially people who are like me, right are going to like amplify marginalized voices who who call out abusers and call out harassers instead of uh, like protecting them and and, yeah. and justifying it and coming up with re- you know writing it all off. Yeah, we had actually I forgot to do this on a previous podcast. We had someone write in to us about our our conversations around me too which we've done extensively on the show um, and we often not always but we often just say women. Um, and they they wrote in to say that they really liked what we do and they like our work, but they felt felt it was that we were erasing the fact that non-binary folks um, get abused and that men and boys get abused and that the language we were using was very limiting. And shout out, thank you for writing into us and telling us that because it's true. Mm-hmm. Um, and I didn't mean to er- erase or uh, devalidate or invalidate. 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 I know words. Uh, the experiences of of folks that. Uh, that are not cis women. Um, so yeah, and I think that that that's that's yeah, whatever. Um, can, can I yeah. can I say something about that? Yeah. Um, I uh, I think it's really important for people who are just now kind of like waking up to the reality that women have lived in for your entire existence. I think it's really important for for particularly men to realize that you may have fucked up in the past unintentionally and you can stop fucking up literally right now. 
and you can like and you true, can like yeah. you can like do that going forward. <laughs> yeah. Or well, actually, yeah. can I add to that? Yeah. It's it's that you will probably continue fucking up, but you can be conscious about how to like be a good ally and do better and learn from your mistakes, and that yeah. it's a lifelong task and a lifelong goal in any level of privilege that you might embody um, to constantly strive and work to be better. That is. Um, almost verbatim the second half of what, of, of what, I, was, oh, of what I was going for. Sorry. No, it's great. It's good. I used to get really angry and defensive when people would, would yell at me. And I still think yelling at people is not the best way to communicate to them. Unless and they're when, Nazis. And when, unless they're Nazis. Fuck them. The best way to communicate to a Nazi is with a fist to their mouth. Um, but but I, 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 would, I, I, was, I, I once, I once said, I once said to, a, to a person, you know, if you weren't screaming at me, like I'm, we're on the same side. And if you weren't screaming at me, we, we, I could learn so much from you. And she was like, "Now you're tone policing me." And I was like, "No, no, I'm not. I'm just saying, like, stop yelling at me. Uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry for what I represent to you, but like, I'm trying so hard, right?" And and we just could not see eye to eye, and I think we ended up blocking each other because I was just like, you know, I've done everything that I can, and and nothing is going to be good enough, and that gets so frustrating. And when people would say to me something about your privilege and that sort of thing, I would feel like a lot of white guys, right? Like, but I try real hard to not do that, and it took forever for me to like really internalize and realize but what so that means. You realized how the that in that situation. You were tone police. That I was the bad guy. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Just and making sure I don't need to call you out right now in front yes. of this entire yeah, audience. I did. Cool. I did. <laughs> cool. I did. Um, I can, I mean, I, 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 I have experienced that it is a lot, I come across, I, I've occasionally run into people who just want to yell at me and just want to be angry. And I get that. Like, your anger is super valid. And, and the experience that you have lived is completely, like, that is your experience. And it's not my job to, like, it's not right for me to say that your experience is, you know, is making mine uncomfortable or, or whatever. What I, what I really hope people will, under, will understand is that there are a lot of folks who really, 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 really are on, on like, on the, on the, the right side of this. Yeah, and I, And when you scream at us, it makes us just shrivel up and go away. Well, I think that's, like, the job of allies is to talk to those people, right? The whole point of allyship is that, but, and, I, and I will say that, like, people who experience, um, whether it's harassment or people, you know, in the minority, oftentimes we feel like we have to scream in order to ever be heard. So, like, if you're ever coming up against someone who who is yelling and you're wondering why, a possible answer is that they literally have to to make you hear them, or that they're that that's the pattern. That's what they've been taught because no one ever fucking listens. Sorry, my language. Uh, I- Totally. Yeah. <laughs> Have you ever listened? So that's to like that. That's like a really great way of like in that moment, sort of empathizing with them. But I think a huge part of allyship is being that person who doesn't have to yell because you're heard more than a lot of other people. So like being that ambassador who can go out and talk to people who would be upset if someone yelled at them like, "Hey, that thing you said is fucking racist. What's wrong with you?" Um, and that would get defensive. The ally's job is to like be that because it's so much patient patience on our part that is just unreasonable, like to ask of us after yeah. we've been, you know, it's yeah. A lot of so, it is completely that, unreasonable. Of, that's like, yeah, it's so much labor, and that and that's why allyship is the mo- is like just so important in that context, right? Because I agree, no one wants to get yelled at. So anyway, we we're talking about pop culture. How's it going? This is I. <laughs> This is all a part of the sphere of, I, yeah. I do, uh, I, maybe we shift gears just a little bit to something, I think this is a totally valid conversation, but something a little uplifting. I'd be curious what media you both find inspiring right now. I mean, well, Black Panther came out oh, yeah, sorry. a week before this. Yeah. <laughs> did I ask that quite, what did I ask at the top? I've already forgotten. It's been 30 oh, minutes. Oh, just something we'd seen recently? I oh, think. yeah, okay. Yeah. But what okay, well, Black us? Panther's just going to win everything. Yeah, I think... Okay, okay, well, here. I will give you a Wait, set I've, of... I've oh, got, I've got a great. thing. That's not Black Panther? That's not sure? Black Panther, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I recently replayed Journey for the first oh, time the in a real long game. time. It's the best game. Yeah. And uh, I never want to discuss it too gr- in, in too granular a fashion because the... The joy I felt at the end of my first playthrough because of what was revealed to me is one of the greatest gifts I've ever unwrapped. Yeah. And um, 
I feel like we are living in a, this terrible moment in history. We are, if you're an Asimov nerd, like we're in the middle of a Selden crisis right now. And, 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 and people don't talk to each other. They talk at each other. And, it, and, and you know, and it's, it's, uh, it's, that's like, that's really rough. And let's record it. The, the, <laughs> the, the experience and journey, the, the camaraderie and the and the the gentle friendship and the and like and the love and the the experience that I had agreeing on how uh, we would communicate mm. was so gratifying to me and it made me feel like yes Mr. Frodo there's some things worth fighting for you know like it just yeah. it was just and it was one of those things where like I feel like we spend so much time and it's important it's good we spend so much time about how toxic and fucked up gaming is and I I loved that this was this was a joyful, bonding, meaningful experience. Yeah. Um, and and that was it was it was profound for me. Like I was like, oh right, I remember this. I need this in my life. Yeah, and I it think, still had that same impact. Yeah. yeah. I think journey is that's the one word to describe it profound in every yeah. way possible. Yeah, if you're not familiar, please look it up. It's a very short game, so and and also doesn't require like gaming knowledge. So it's a great first game for people who don't play. So if you want to introduce, you know, a parent or someone who's not into gaming, Journey is possibly one of the best ways to do it, I'd say. And people who are into it, like, those of us who are into it, like, we want you in it so bad. Like, we want you to come in. Like, we want to hug you. Like, we we will hug you to death so you will play Journey. Like, that's how much we love it. It's not like any of the, like, first-person shooter combat team-based games where, where it's, you know, that really toxic masculinity community. This is just about, like... Oh my God! I love this. It made me feel as good as anything has ever made me feel. I want you to feel that too. That's what I love about that game. I hosted a show for Sony for a little while, and we were interviewing the. the, the yeah, you don't know about it. I don't know about it. Yeah, that's why they canceled the show. Oh. Um, it's weird. Like they spent a lot of money on the show. You would have expected them to promote it a little bit. I don't know. Um, maybe on those consoles they have in all everyone's homes. Um, but I was interviewing the studio that made it. And uh, we were supposed to be talking about something completely different. And all I wanted to talk about was Journey. And I hear my producer <laughs> in my ear like, we get that you love Journey, but we need to promote this new thing or whatever. I don't even remember what it was. And you're like, no, that game company, Journey. Only. You're like, I'm on stage now with the mic. I get to do whatever. Yeah, and for they real. fired you yeah. and canceled the yeah. show. Got it. Okay, cool. Um, did the media did media play roles in your career choices or like in what you're doing now or like is there do you, is there a connection as a kid that like really inspired you? It's funny because a lot of people who are in games now. So again, I'm in video games, uh, and a lot of people who are in games now would say, "Yeah, I played video games growing up, and I've always wanted to make them." But like, no, consoles and video games were not broadly allowed in my life as a child, and maybe that is why I ended up in video games because it wasn't a thing that I was allowed to do. Um, and so my first console was a PlayStation 2, and I was a teenager, and my dad hogged it all the time. He never let me play, ever. <laughs> he came home. I got the first PlayStation 2 in my hometown, and I hyperventilated upon seeing it, and he pulled out Gran Turismo 3 and told me I was never allowed to play, and then woke up at 5 in the morning and played between 5 and 8 a.m., and anyway, it, long, it doesn't matter. You One time I had play, a date why, why, over... Why were you forbidden to play Gran Turismo? Just in ge- uh, video games in general, like oh, okay. it was just a withholding thing that you oh, thought sure, was okay. funny. Uh, like I'm like, that's weird. Is there some mode in Gran Turismo I don't know about that? Like <laughs> that would a make that game fun and two make it a game that kids wouldn't play. No, but I love that he bought the most boring game possible and yeah. until he's like, oh, this seven hundred dollar machine, and yeah. also I got the most boring game in the world, yeah. and you can't play it. So, but no, I mean, I I sort of um, as a kid didn't really have any any connection to games. Um, some, some I did, and I went over to friends' houses and played stuff all the time. Um, but I think games were just a thing that were romanticized in movies and TV in like the 80s and 90s in a way that really appealed to me. And then uh, really what happened is like the birth of indie games as a, as a medium, as like a, a valid way of making a career um, and selling something. Uh, and that wasn't until like 2010, 2009 or so. Yeah. But yeah, I think there's no way if, if gaming hadn't been glorified as a child, if the power glove hadn't been a thing when I was a kid, 
I wouldn't have oh, been like... Oh, the power. <laughs> I just... You know, like, that was the future, and I was like, oh, this is going to happen. And then in 2009, I was like, now, it's now. And now like, <laughs> I do play my Switch quite a bit, and that's about as close as I think we're going to get. Switch but so much. My, uh, luckily, uh, VR makes me, like, when I put on a VR headset, I also put, like, a, a bag around my ears right here as, like, a trough for when I have to vomit. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm, like, I'm like, I got this. All right, let's 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 be in the... Uh, yeah, just keep, <laughs> muscle through it. Muscle through it. Uh, <laughs> So I bet you're don't really even skip a beat. I don't even skip a beat. happening on the stage. Right I quite, now. This is look, the worst part of the ship. For I'm not. You know, swaying. I have to disagree because the way, the crashing of the waves keeps my adrenaline up just <laughs> enough. <laughs> the fact that at any given moment we might be crashing into an iceberg. Don't ask me. It's fine. Uh, <laughs> as I've been taught, uh, we're in Mexico. I mean, the global warming is real, but like, uh, but it's the opposite. Yeah. Well, sure, yeah, who knows, yeah. I don't know. Uh, I'm not a scientist. Don't Icebergs don't exist anymore. I'm not a scientist. Uh, but anyway, so that that is keeping my adrenaline right at the level of, of like, it's okay, the swing is a is just a, it's a warning sign before you all go down. And we're first, so I feel good about... All right, let's move on to something else. Uh, did you want to briefly answer that question before the next podcast segment as a uh so i uh, as i said earlier in spite of my best efforts to be like a working on camera actor i am primarily a voice actor and and in, like an indie writer and um i watch I, I i watch movies to be entertained but i also watch movies to take apart the story and understand it and understand the pacing and the storytelling. And I'm starting to see things in, in movies that, that I never would have seen before. And what, I've, what I recently realized is that when I was younger, I would watch a movie to be entertained, and then I would watch a movie for the performances, and I would kind of study the performances because I thought of myself as an actor, and I wanted to get better that way. And over the years, um, I have drifted farther and farther away from that to where I am now watching it for the storytelling and mm. watching it for the structure and the writing and trying to become a better writer. And I feel like, you know, I, I, um, I, I feel like, like we are, the, we are a, 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 the result of every experience we've had up, up until this second. And um, I think it's important. I was, I've been thinking about how we say, you know, live a life without regrets, but I think regret's actually really useful. Like, I regret a dumb thing that I did, so I will try not to do that dumb thing again. I regret saying no to a cool adventure. I will say yes to the next cool adventure that I have. Um, I kind of regret that I spent so much of my life um, trying to live someone else's dream to be an actor when what I have always really wanted to be is a writer. And uh, I am learning now how I can balance those things. Like acting when I get to do it pays my bills and it opens a lot of doors for me. But writing like feeds my soul and that's like where my passion is. Yeah. So when, when like what has really affected me and I look back on it are the the books that I read and and the and the stories that I heard that m- inspired me and made me like want to do them. So like I'm trying real hard to put together a little anthology series uh, that is like six to eight episodes, um, and each one has a different kind of like uh, exploitation grindhouse trope on it. So there will be one of, that has a cannibal thing in it, and one that has like a kung fu thing in it, or whatever. And I have been, I know it's, I know it's. Listen, it's totally stupid, but. I love those movies, and I love the anthology things, and I love like Tales from the Crypt and and, and Tales from the Dark Side and yep. The Outer Limits and Twilight Zone and stuff. And I think like honestly, the thing that affected me the most of anything was coming home after school and watching Twilight Zone. Yeah, oh, Twilight like, Zone more is, than yeah. anything else. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah nice. agreed. Nice, cool. All right, let's quickly do a little. What's your freak out? Oh, Which, what's my freak out again? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember. Yeah. <laughs> uh, what's your freak out is our little segment where we talk about things that we're freaking out about, whether good, bad, neutral. Felix, what's your freak out? I have, you don't know this about me, but I have a lot of opinions about a lot of things. So this was really tough for me to choose. Um, but I'm going to do a game today. And uh, the game I'm going to do is uh, Assassin's Creed Origins. And Assassin's Creed Origins is the, I don't know, fifth, fifth-ish I have no idea if it's five hundred and twenty-six seven thousand entry installation in the, in the Assassin's Creed um, uh, line, and Assassin's Creed is normally a game about running around in the past 
no spoilers, uh, in the past, as an assassin, uh, stabbing people and, uh, and or shooting them or disposing of them in some way. And there's a storyline, and, and the, the appeal for me was always this, like, huge world, and uh, when the first one came out, it was like, oh, everything's so detailed. Of course, if I go back and watch it, the faces are horribly textured, and everything looks... It's fine. Don't worry. It, it, hindsight the is HD. Yeah, hi, hi, yeah, hindsight is HD. Um, but, but uh, you know, after a while, I stopped playing them because the idea of going back in time or, or having this mechanic and, and just stabbing people all day was a little less appealing to me as I became more critical of the things I loved. And uh, just this week, one of the coolest things, I think, in AAA gaming in the past 10 years was announced, and that's Assassin's Creed Origins' educational version. So in order to create a game like Assassin's Creed, no matter what city is it set in, and this one's set in Egypt, um, you ha- the team does years of research into what this might look like and what you know the time period looks like and all of the history, 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 you know, history uh, in in the game. And that usually just goes overlooked because you're just looking for your next target to kill. Um, but in educational version, they turn off all the game mechanics: the murder, the murder, the murder. <laughs> Uh, and and open it up to just showing off the research they did, and and they have narration, and so you're just exploring this incredibly rich world and hopefully historically accurate world um, with with a little bit of narration and a little bit of uh, guidance, and you can choose you can either go on a tour. I think I don't quote me on this, but I I, I guess I'm being recorded, so technically I'm being quoted. But uh, uh, <laughs> you know, either you can go on a tour or I'm on a boat. I don't have the internet. I don't know, fucking, I'm making all this up. Uh, you can go on a tour, or you could just explore on your own. And this has been done before in some games when it comes to dev. So it has been done, I, like even Firewatch uh, did a, like a dev log type thing. I'm being shown a note, but I don't know which no, one it is not. on the screen. Okay. I realize that. Uh, did a dev log I loved type that thing. mode in Firewatch, by the way. Right, it's a great I mode. I loved it. And so what happens is in Firewatch, you can go through the game again and uh, play and hear the developers and sort of their, uh, their thoughts on the development process. But this is not that. This is not, sh- this is not a developer talking about their code. This is developers talking about the research they did to make the game accurate and believable and good. And that goes overlooked so often. I just, yeah. I think we're so used to seeing, sh- like, entering this incredibly huge space in a game and looking for the next shiny or the next person to murder. And, and you just miss out on all these gorgeous things that some poor person spent two years researching, like how to make this one stone. What did this one stone look like? You know, and that kind of thing. So um, in Firewatch, it was a post. It was like a... a that's a, I, the question I, is, you know can what? you still pet if, the cats? Yeah, if you yeah, can't pet the cats anymore, I'm not buying I'm out. I'll, I take back everything I just said. Uh, yeah, no. But, um, yeah. but yeah, so I think for me, my freak out this week, or whenever, whatever this is, this time, a, yeah. this week. Yeah, this week. Sure. Is that, uh, is that this is something that I hope more AAA games do in the future. I really hope that it's a, the start of a trend and something much bigger because video games as education would be so cool. And if we can have both, yeah. why not? <laughs> okay. All right, Will, what is your freak out this week? My freak out is that I realized um, I, uh, in, in the last few months that I have just aged out of the demo for a lot of the media that I've always loved that it's no longer being made for me. And that's okay. Like, that's, I, I think it's, it's fine. You know, there's, we, we have to accept that sometimes we are not the target audience for a thing. That there is, uh, that, that the, the, the generation that is, that is the target audience is being served by, by my generation that wants to do something different, right? And wants to create something new. And that's okay. It's totally fine. I don't have to like everything. That said, I fucking <laughs> hate Cuphead so much. Wow. I it also makes hate Cuphead. me so angry. All right. Because... The music is sensational. The art, the voicing, the writing, the design. It is one of the most magnificent, gorgeous games I have ever seen in my life. And I cannot beat a single <laughs> level at all. You know, Will, there's and an easy mode. And it's not, there's an I, easy I know mode. there's an easy mode, but what's the point? 
You don't. You can't advance if you just play easy mode. That's true. Yeah, you can't. Like that's right. there's it's it's that I call that fuck you mode. Yeah. Because they're like, oh, you did all the work. Fuck you. Right. Um, so my son, who is 28, who loves Dark Souls and, and, and loves games like that, is crazy about Cuphead and is at the final level. And I, I've sat and watched him play, and like I get anxious watching him play. But th this is a comparison that I can make. Red Dead Redemption is one of my favorite games of all time. I absolutely love it. I am so hyped for, the, for Red Dead uh, 2 coming out. Um, later this year. If I was... <laughs> sorry. Well, yeah, we, sorry. We have to just yeah, say, I have opinions. We're hoping I that there might be some ladies in it that don't if, get put on... I, I, do, not, I do not disagree with that yeah. at all. I, um, and I know Bonnie or whatever the fuck her name is. Whatever. We don't need to go Let the men that. speak. Yeah. I, <laughs> I, <laughs> won't someone I, I finally know. let this white guy have I, an opinion? I just know I'm going to get shit for saying are there women... <laughs> like, where are the women going to be when they're, everyone's like, oh, there's a one chick. Yeah, okay. Just I'm, the um, internet is in my head. Constantly. Yeah, I just got to say, white yeah. dude, shut the fuck up. Like, yeah, like please. we get our representation Stop literally everywhere. <laughs> it's fine. We can ha like get out of the way, right? If I had not been able to spend literally a hundred hours yeah. in Red Dead Redemption just riding my horse and watching the sunset, I would not love that game the way that I do. They made it possible for me to enjoy the game in different ways. Mm -hmm. And I get, and this is what I'm saying. Cuphead isn't that. It is for like, and, and I heard you talking with Mike about loving platformers. And I was thinking back to how much I loved f just fighting through Mario 3 and, and how hard it was and, and like how there was no continue. It was like farm as many extra lives as you can because you're going to lose them all on the double jump. And, like, <laughs> and, and, and finally getting through that and remembering like, oh, that was amazing. So Cuphead is that, but the whole game is that. So what I hate is I want to be in that game. I want to listen to that music. I want to watch the animation. I want to experience, but I can't. I am locked out of it because I'm not good enough at those super fast, super twitchy, like, like pattern recognition kinds, kinds of games. And it's not for me, and that is fine, but it is what I am freaking out about. <laughs> that I Fair. wish, I wish, I wish that I could put into it. But instead of doing that, I would rather walk through Skyrim and pick flowers. Oh, that's delightful. Yeah. <laughs> All right. My freak out this week is um, not, not fully formed. Sorry. Uh, and there's no internet, so I can't look anything up. I have internet. Oh, can I do it really quick? Do you okay, want no. Um, so I, uh, on the flight out here, I watched, well, not here, but on the flight out to San Diego, I watched Creed because it was available oh my God. Uh, on the plane. He's so hot. He's so oh hot. My God. <laughs> He's super hot. Um, but part of why I want, so I've already seen Creed, and part of why I watched it again was because I can't stop thinking about Black Panther, and I also can't stop thinking about the Ryan Coogler, Michael B. Jordan combination, because Ryan Coogler, the director, made Creed and Fruitvale Station, and Michael B. Jordan is in all of those, and they are all amazing films. So, whatever. Sitting on a plane. Gonna watch Creed again. One thing, I re vaguely remember their conversations coming out around Creed uh, about the, the girlfriend character um, played by what's her name who I can't remember right now and I can't remember her name as an actor and now I have no internet to look this up because usually I'm prepared for these things. Hey, <laughs> Anita, I was really upset that you erased that woman from I did. your story about I totally, the movie. I did, I did, I totally erased her. But so what I was thinking about was that, yeah, like, so storytelling and film, like, these are, it's a predictable, like, it's, you know, obviously based on Rocky, and so it's a predictable, <laughs> Felix is losing it. It's, it's a predictable uh, mode of storytelling, right? Like, it is a, it's a three-act structure and blah, 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 and there's the best montage. I love montages. Fuck anyone who doesn't like montages. They are so empowering. It made me be like, I gotta go work out, and then I went to the gym when I got on the boat, and I was like, oh, God, I did two crunches. It's so hard. Um, okay, anyways. I'd work out way more if, like, montaging was, like, just a legitimate way of getting things done. Yes. Just, like... You're the best around, and now I've got abs. That's amazing. <laughs> it's amazing. <laughs> uh, anyways, so my point being is that I was watching it a little more critically to, to her character, and um, so these secondary characters or the girlfriend characters often don't have a lot of character development, and we complain about them because they're just around to be like hype men, basically, right? They're just there to be like, you can do it, or like add an extra level of depth and blah, blah, blah. <laughs> 
I really like that in this, even though she is that role, mm. and even though there isn't, it is not her story, so given all these limitations, they did a lot to give her backstory, mm -hmm. right? She has a, a disability, or, and she has a career, and she has feelings about it, and, like, there's more to her. And I feel like it's an example of, like, okay, if you have to have these secondary characters and sort of push them aside because they're not the, like, the A plot or even the B plot, um, that, like, at least she's a real person. Yeah. And so, whatever. That was just what I was thinking about on the plane. Um, also, I love the actor that plays her um, and who was delightful in Thor Ragnarok as well. Mm -hmm. Veronica Mars, shout out. Tessa Thompson, thank you so... God, we should record in front of an audience all the time. <laughs> um, so if you haven't seen Creed, I highly recommend it. I think it's a delightful movie. Um, and we are massively over time. So, I mean, three minutes isn't massive. It is to me. I'm such a... I just, it's, okay. oh I just feel bad because someone else has to come on the stage. And, okay. okay. <laughs> I appreciate it. All right. Now um, it's massive. Will... Before, yes, I, before we started, I sort of dodged wanting to... Uh, he, uh, wanted, people know you as an actor, but yeah. you do so many other things. Yeah. So I would, very quickly, is there a thing you're working on that you want to share, and where can people find you if they want to find you? I am It's Will Wheaton on every social network except Twitter, where I'm at Will W. I try to spend less time on Twitter than I ever did before because Twitter fucking sucks. Jack, you are a failure as a CEO, and you should be ashamed <laughs> of yourself. Um, Did you know that Will has opinions? Um, uh, my blog is willwheaton.net. Um, and uh, I'm writing as much as I can. Um, I have some really cool things in the pipeline that I can't talk about because the contracts haven't been announced. But by the time we get back to the world, this, will be, uh, this news will be released. Uh, I'm narrating Scalzi's new book. Yay! Uh, I'm really excited about that. Um, and then also er earlier, earlier, well, last, last year... Last year, I, I wrote... Um, so there was a funny moment where I said... I, I just thought, somebody stood up and said, yay, and it's hilarious because they kind of look like Scalzi, but I think that is Scalzi. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah so I'm really, I'm really excited about that. It's, gonna be, it's really going to be a lot of fun. But I wrote a novella last year called Dead Trees Give No Shelter. That is the way that I dealt with the loss of a person who's really close to me. And, um, the, and it, I felt like it just fell flat. Like mm -hmm. no, like, I was like, for three and a half million Twitter followers, like if I sold through like a percentage of sales, it was like less than one half of one tenth of one percent. And I was like super discouraged about that. Mm -hmm. So I think that's probably because I just didn't promote it enough. So um, if you, if you want to read a thing that I wrote that's really meaningful to me, it's a supernatural horror story. Um, it is on Amazon. It's in the Kindle store. Uh, you can buy a DRM-free version of it at my website at willwheaton.net. And I also um, uh, paid for and, and produced and released an audio version of it, which can be found at willwheaton.bandcamp.com. Nice. And awesome. we will definitely link all that in the show notes Thanks. for folks who want to check that out. Felix Kramer. Where, where can people find you? Oh, where can you find me? Here, currently. Yes, forever. You will forever uh, be I'm, on yeah, the I live here now at the front of this boat with the waves <laughs> crashing behind me. I'm too afraid to get up now. So, um, yeah, I'm uh, at Lego Butts on Twitter. <laughs> Careful what you brand yourself, kids. <laughs> it sticks with you for a long time. So, at Lego Butts on Twitter. Uh, I'm at felix.zone for my website. It's the best URL. It's a pretty, it's a pretty good URL. It's not bad. It's not. It's good. It's pretty it's good. Best. It's better than Lego Butts. I don't know. Lego, no, I don't know. Lego Butts would be a pretty it's great just... URL. Okay. It's good. It's good. Yeah. Good. Okay. So maybe it's yeah. not that bad. I feel better. Uh, but though, yeah, those are the two places to find me mainly. Yeah. That's our show, y'all. Thank you so much for being a wonderful audience. You're so great. You can find me at Anita Sarkeesian on Twitter. You can find everything about Feminist Frequency at FemFreak or our other podcasts and videos and all the things we do at FeministFrequency.com. Feminist Frequency comes out every single Wednesday. Thank you at home and here for joining us. Have a great night. Bye. Bye.